Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. During 2021, the State Historical Society is commemorating the upcoming 175th anniversary of Iowa statehood. In March, which is Iowa History Month, the Iowa History 101 webinar series expands to every Tuesday and Thursday. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend. And don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today, we will learn about Amir Abdelkader's life, legacy, and impact on Iowa, as well as his connections to El Kader, Iowa. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speakers. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are now available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague, Matt Beyer, is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speakers at the end of the presentation, but please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. And now I'm pleased to introduce our speakers in the order that they will present. Up first is Kathy Garms. Kathy is a native of El Cater and is the Absol Cater Education Project or AEP co-founder. She is a lifelong learner passionate about music, travel, nature, and building a global community. As a US aid volunteer in Kyrgyzstan, Kathy experienced cultures and landscapes different from Iowa, which led to her interest in cultural understanding, citizen di di diplomacy, and civic engagement. She revived Al Qaeda's sister community program with Mascara Algeria, strengthening friendships and building relationships between the US and Algeria. Kathy organized the Al Qaeda launch of John Kaiser's biography, Commander of the Faithful, that inspired the Al Qaeda essay contest and evolved into AEP. Kathy continues to share the Abdul Qaeda story with the hope of a more civilized world for all people. Our second speaker is John Kaiser. John is an author, entrepreneur, and program manager for the William and Mary Grieve Foundation. In the 1970s, he established a business introducing US corporations to opportunities for acquiring rights to advanced technologies in the Soviet Union. In 1993, he was made an honorary member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Since 1998, he's led the effort to attack illiteracy about Islam using the life story of Amir Abdelkader. His books include Communist Entrepreneurs, Unknown Innovators in the Global um, Economy, The Monks of Tiberine, and The Commander of Faith, A Story of True Jihad. He has a history degree from Columbia University and, and business degrees from the University of Chicago. Our concluding speaker is Matt Peterson. Matt is the executive, executive director of the Applicator Education Project. His career in the military enabled him to travel around the world to more than 30 countries, where he experienced the conflicts caused by cultural ignorance firsthand. After retiring from the military, he came to AEP with a passion for resolving conflicts by building bridges between people with different backgrounds. He has a bachelor's degree in philosophy and government from New Mexico State University and a master's in organizational leadership from Gonzaga University. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Kathy to begin the webinar. Thank you, Jennifer, for this opportunity to share our story about a Muslim footprint in America's heartland. My colleagues and I will briefly tell you about Emir Abdelkader's legacy, his connection to El Qaeda's history and the Abdul Qader Education Project. Today, my focus will be on the Al Qaeda connection. So who could imagine that a small rural town in America's heartland, El Qaeda, Iowa, would be remembering a 19th century world-renowned Arab Muslim hero? Well, Al Qaeda's founders had no way of knowing that selecting the name of their community set the stage for international experiences for future generations. Did Emir Abdel Qadr visit Iowa? Well, no, actually, but people do ask. So here's the story. 
Timothy Davis, a lawyer, businessman, and politician, migrated west from Newark, New Jersey. He eventually settled in Dubuque, where he defended local loggers from US government prosecutors. Davis lived from time to time in El Cater and actually died on the front porch of his El Cater home. Davis's law firm continues in Dubuque today. O'Connor and Thomas was founded in 1840 under the name of Davis and Crawford. It is the oldest law firm in continuous practice west of the Mississippi River. Davis and his business partners, John Thompson and Chester Sage, found an ideal site for a flour mill on the banks of the Turkey River. This was a tributary upstream from Dubuque on the Mississippi River. Davis, Thompson, and Sage laid out a new settlement on the Turkey River, and Davis was given the task of naming it. Lytle's Living Age was a magazine comprising selections from various British and American magazines and newspapers. Generally, this magazine was published on a weekly basis and was in print from 1844 to 1941. In the 1840s, this publication had been cheering on the Algerian hero in his long chivalrous resistance against the French colonial forces in the Regency of Algiers, which was then a part of the Ottoman Empire. Timothy Davis was a man of strong character who was educated and interested in the outside world. Thanks to Lytle's living age, Davis, along with much of the developing world, had been following the exploits of a famous and dare, daring Arab chieftain named Emir Abdel Qadir. Emir Abdel Qadir was born in Vietnam, near Mascara City, Algeria. He received a broad education, including theology, linguistics, and philosophy. He was a highly trained horseman, a poet, a statesman, a great orator, and a natural leader. Abdul Qadir's values and personal character matched the ideals for a new community in a young country. Many Americans considered Abdul Qadir a freedom fighting cousin in a David and Goliath battle against mighty France. On June 22nd, 1846, Timothy Davis named the new settlement El Cater in honor of this famous kindred soul. The name Abdel Qadir was shortened to suit local tongues. El Cater is the only functioning town in America named after a Muslim. At the heart of El Cater stands the historic 1889 Keystone Bridge, which spans the Turkey River Made of native limestone, it is one of the largest twin arched keystone bridges west of the Mississippi River. For me, it is a symbol for building bridges of cultural understanding. The Carter House Museum has original furnishings and collections sharing El Cater's history. In addition, the Algeria Room showcases Algerian artifacts, such as the hand-woven wool rug pictured here. This rug was a result of collaboration between the El Cater Girl Scouts and people of Tiaret, Algeria. And this was all happening through the UN International Fund for Agricultural Development. Funds were collected by the El Cater Girl Scouts and sent to Tiaret to buy sheep. The first wool harvested was made into this beautiful rug and sent to El Cater as a gift. Touring the Carter House Museum were guests who participated in our Abdel Carter Education Project Forum. Did you know that how you wear a burnous tells a story? Well, in this photo, Dr. Belgossam Haba is wearing an authentic camel hair burnous from Algeria. He showed us variations on wearing this traditional men's cloak. On display at the museum, you will also find the 1915 Al-Qaeda High School graduating class publication, The Sheikh. 
It stands as the oldest acknowledgement in print to date that honors El Cater's namesake. The characteristics of the Emir were valued in 1915 as much as today. Prior to the 1950s, El Cater High School and junior college publications were called the Sheikh and the Arab Chieftain. The sports teams were called the Arabs, all in honor of the Emir. The El Cater Mascara Sister City Program began in 1984 when 10 El Cater citizens traveled to Mascara City to facilitate signing of the joint sister city documents. A youth exchange followed. And through the years, Algerian ambassadors visited Al Qaeda, along with other Algerians. When Mascara's hospital was damaged by fire, Al Qaeda sent funds for rebuilding the hospital. By the end of the 1990s, most of our Algerian contacts were lost. In 2007, I revived the Sister City program, and this led to an invitation to speak as Sister City President representing Al Qaeda at the 2008 Council of Nation and Abdelkader Foundation Conference in Algiers. The Council of Nation Conference in Algiers was entitled Emir Abdelkader and Human Rights. Representatives from countries surrounding the Mediterranean Sea participated. Everyone was eager to hear about El Qaeda in America's heartland that was named after Algeria's hero. Tours of Algiers historic sites included Emir Abdelkader's grave. After meeting with Council of Nation Chairman Abdelkader Ben Salah, we visited Mascar to renew relationships. In 2008, El Cater suffered a devastating flood that destroyed the lower part of town. Over 30 homes were lost and many businesses suffered major damage. The Algerian president sent a personal message of compassion to El Cater citizens, along with a generous gift of $150,000 to assist with flood recovery. Algeria's Independence Day is July 5th. Al Qaeda planned a celebration to honor Independence Days for both countries in July 2008. But shortly after our June flood, it became a celebration of community and Algerian sister cities friendship. The Al Qaeda Opera House was filled celebrating the volunteers who worked very, very hard and celebrated with the Algerian ambassador, Amin Kirby, who joined us. Al Qaeda citizens gratefully acknowledged Algeria for the generous support of Al Qaeda's flood recovery. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the photo on the right features Mascara Park, which is situated beside Al Qaeda City Hall with a peace pole in Arabic, French, and English. It reads, may peace prevail on earth. In the left photo is an identical peace pole located in the middle of a roundabout in Mascara City. Both peace poles were made by an El Qaeda lamp maker who donated them as gifts to both communities. Today, after many years of work, the reclaimed flood property is home to Founders Park and improved waterfront access to water activities. The public space includes walking paths, playground, soccer fields, and shelters next to the Turkey River. It's a perfect location for community festivities. So why are we talking about a 19th century world-renowned Arab Muslim hero here today? Well, in 2008, John Kaiser launched his book, Commander of the Faithful, The Life and Times of Emir Abdelkader in El Qaeda. Although I am a native of El Qaeda, it wasn't until reading this book that I actually grew to appreciate my hometown's namesake and legacy. Commander of the Faithful inspired the Abdelkader Education Project, which you will learn about later. 
So this coming June 19th, al Qaeda will celebrate its founding 175 years. We invite you to join us in celebrating our town with its rich history and remarkable namesake. All are welcome. Next up is Abdul Qadr Education Project co-founder, author, and my friend, John Kaiser. He brings many years of research and dedication that inspire serious dialogue and understanding about the Emir. Enjoy. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, my, uh, my journey, if you will, from uh, Washington DC to France to Algeria and now Rappahannock County, Virginia, where I live. In uh, 1994, I made a uh, life-changing decision at the time living in Washington DC and for 20 years, I've been running a small business, being a great white hunter for American industry and to some extent, the US government. Um, the uh, business was uh, very simple, uh, yet very perplexing to many folks because it involved taking American uh, R&D people into the Soviet Union, uh, telling them that they would like to get some of their technology if they have it, because we all know they're they're buying our technology, so why don't we get some of theirs? Well, of course, nobody believed the Russians had technology, or if they had it, they certainly wouldn't sell it. That was a stereotype, and and uh, as you know, stereotypes are powerful things. So um, I had a little business, and uh, and and when people would actually come and say, "Well, how do you do this? What, what's your secret?" I'd say, "Well, you 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 go to Aeroflot, buy a ticket." go to uh, Moscow and ask for a place called uh, uh, License in Torg. And that's the, uh, that's the Walmart of technology buying for the Soviet Union back in the Cold War era, because we're talking the 70s and 80s. Uh, but after doing that for uh, almost 20 years, uh, Perestroika came along and uh, I was in my 50s and I thought, well, I wanna do something different. I have two kids, I wanna take them somewhere, get exposed to a new culture. And uh, my wife too was in favor of that. And so uh, 1994, uh, my 11 and 12 year old uh, children, my wife and I, we went to uh, France and spent uh, a year in Saint Paul de Vence, it was hardship duty. Uh, and uh, I had three objectives. One was uh, to enjoy living in France, the French lifestyle, if you will. Uh, I also wanted to uh, read the Bible. I'd never read the Bible in my life, even though I had gone to a, a, a boarding school, which uh, touted itself as being a religious school, a place called Groton in Groton, Massachusetts. But for um, six years, I said the Lord's Prayer, but never knew what it actually meant. And then uh, finally, I wanted to meet Muslims. This was the era when uh, uh, the Islam thing had replaced the Russian, uh, the Russian thing. Uh, the Russian enemy uh, was not looking so fierce uh, in the 90s with perestroika. And uh, we were suffering from uh, enemy deficit disorder. Um, I'm not a big fan of uh, demonizing groups of any kind, uh, and of course the, the demonization of, of Islam struck me as uh, particularly stupid, but uh, I wanted to educate myself and I thought a good way to do that would be to uh, meet with Muslims in, uh, in Vance, which was facilitated by the fact that there was a, a Catholic priest who uh, had, uh, had a, a sort of ecumenical, ecumenical uh, uh, groups come together and discuss each other's faith and, and what they believed and what the differences were. Well, it turned out the differences were quite minimal uh, in my mind in any event. Uh, but the two big things that really surprised me 
uh, was how much Muslims love Jesus. Jesus, and for some Muslims, is actually the number one prophet because he was without sin. And also, um, they, um, they don't worship Muhammad. Most people in this country think Russians, uh, Russians are <laughs> still back in the Russian phase, uh, think that, uh, that uh, Muslims worship Muhammad. No, they don't. Muhammad is a prophet. Was the last prophet. So these sort of things made me realize uh, how little I knew and uh, and how interesting things might be if I want to learn more. <laughs> um, came back to the United States and uh, was desiring to find a way to stay connected to France and to Algeria because at this time Algeria was undergoing a a, a nasty civil war. Uh, and uh, ISIS was preceded there by the GIA, which was their ISIS in those days. Um, and I wanted to uh, deepen my knowledge. And I thought an opportunity came when I read about the killing of uh, Trappist monks in, uh, in Algeria in 90, I think it was 96. And I thought, here's a way to learn more about Islam, learn about the painful love-hate relationship between France and Algeria, which I came to view as a microcosm of the American dilemma, if it's a dilemma, but the American problem of dealing with Islam and avoiding uh, the kind of stupid demonization that gets us into big trouble. And um, to, to differentiate, to differentiate hard thing for us to do. Uh, so I wrote a book about the monks and their relationship with the Algerians and their surroundings and the culture as a whole. And that became a film in, 19, in 2013 uh, and actually won a, uh, a, a, a Cannes uh, Festival Award as a, a best, best film. And that was, um, my entree to Abdul Qadar because the monks lived in a monastery that was abutting uh, a mountain called Abdul Qadar Rock. And I got curious one day and asked somebody who he was. And they told me a little bit about him. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, maybe I'll write about a book him about a, a book about him as well. And so that's how I got got involved with the Emir. It's how I got involved with uh, Algeria. And, and, and I look at, as I say, the relationship between Algeria and France as a forewarning of what can happen in this country if we blindly demonize Muslims and Arabs. Uh, so uh, the fruit of my uh, writing and, and uh, thinking about this world that I have entered since the mid 90s uh, is pretty well summed up in a video, which you'll see now, that was prompted by the Emir Stein Center in uh, Berkeley, California. And the Emir Stein Center was a creature of Hamza Yusuf, who is an important figure in the Muslim world and uh, lives, uh, and lives uh, in Berkeley and, 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 and uh, raised the money to create this center, which is focused on basically developing interfaith, more interfaith understanding, interfaith knowledge, uh, 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 since so much of what we tend to know about religion seems to be at best partial. Um, so I will push a button here and you will uh, see me give a seven minute summary of who he was and why I think he's an important figure for all people, whether they're religious or not religious. Ready? Ready.
Near Death in Damascus, 1883. And the New York Times was already writing his obituary. Calling him one of the few great men of our time. So who was he? And what made him so great? So great that in 1846, a new settlement was named El Cader in his honor. At the time, Emir Abdul Qadir Al Jazeri had made a name for himself internationally and in the United States as a patriot and a freedom fighter. His struggle to unite disparate tribes to resist French colonization was a mere three generations after a similar American experience for the British. For the French, Abdul Qadir represented a dangerous opponent because of his unprecedented weapon, his humanitarian instincts. This, coupled with religious guidance, caused him to treat French prisoners no differently than his own men when it came to food, medical attention, and respectful behavior. Such information, the French high command did everything possible to keep suppressed. More than 20 years later, those same humanitarian instincts caused him to save thousands of Christian lives in Damascus during the Druze riots of 1860. This won him the admiration of leaders around the world including President Abraham Lincoln, Queen Victoria, Pope Pius IX. Even his former enemy, France, awarded him the Legion of Honor, their highest recognition of valor. His behavior also won the admiration of Muslim leaders, including Imam Shamil, the famed freedom fighter of the Caucasus, and the Ottoman Sultan, Abdul Majid I. Today, his bust holds an honored place in the foyer of the International Red Cross in Geneva, alongside that of founder Henri Dunant, a Swiss businessman and a European advocate of humane treatment of prisoners. Dunant had his own humanitarian instincts reinforced visiting Algiers when he learned of the uncommonly high standards that the Emir held his men to, standards derived from a strict application of Islamic law. So who was he, this Abdul Qadir? He was a scholar, a warrior, a mystic, poet, diplomat, whose faith was drawn from the 11th century Sufi tradition, that of Abdul Qadir al-Jilani. To relate to Abdul Qadir, Americans might think of John Winthrop, the founder and governor of the Massachusetts Bay Company, who ruled by the good book. To Algerians, they have considered Abdul Qadir as their George Washington, since 1962, when they won their independence from France. For Americans, Abdul Qadir represents a story and a faith model that is badly needed today, badly needed to rebalance perceptions of Islam, a religion with over 1.7 billion adherents. And for Muslims, the Emir represents a much needed source of pride and connection to the best in their own tradition. And that is one of the reasons I wrote a book about his life and times. For Abdul Qadar, his religion was not a safety belt holding his identity together, but a platform for exploring the meaning of God's universe. His theology was simple. God is greater, greater than whatever we think God is. No one owns God. So how do Muslims today react to Abdul Qadar's Islam? Mohammed Khan Nasser, publisher of Al-Sharia Journal in Pakistan, a scholar with conservative roots, had this to say about Abdul Qadr. Abdul Qadr is not only a symbol of the Muslim concept of resistance and struggle against foreign domination, but also an embodiment of true theological, moral, and rational ideas taught by Islam. First, he is not overwhelmed by blind zeal to fight at all costs. Rather, he's capable of weighing the pros and cons and making wise decisions. Secondly, he is strictly guided in his decisions by the legal limitations and moral obligations set forth in the divine law. Thirdly, his political animosity with the French doesn't blind him to what they have in common. And finally, he can put himself in his adversary's shoes. Imagine that. He can look into the complexities of the situation and understand the different factors that compel them to follow a certain course. Abdul Qadr's lived faith inspired people of all traditions, like Cardinal Leon Etienne Duval, a champion of Algerian independence. On his deathbed in 1996, Duval predicted that Algeria would one day surprise the world. 
I think it is possible that this is actually unfolding today. As Algerians resolutely and peacefully pursue a change of government that rejects the horrors of the 1990s. Both Duval and the Emir would have agreed wholeheartedly with the Apostle Peter, who advised that faith alone is not enough. To faith, one must add virtue. To virtue, add knowledge. To knowledge, perseverance. To perseverance, self-control. And to self-control, godliness and brotherly love. Abdul Qadr, above all, placed importance on knowledge. But not merely knowledge of things, which he considered like rainwater, but a deeper knowledge of God's ways to enable us to live together in harmony. It is called the golden rule. It's also called love thy neighbor. I'm John Kaiser for the Emir Stein Center. This video was produced in collaboration with Alliance of Virtue. Near death in Damascus. Am I on? Yes. The launch of the book uh, in El Cater uh, has given rise to uh, a network that uh, is summarized by this uh, graphic and gives you a sense that, you know, this is more than just about a book. It's about uh, using the life story and the example of the Emir life and the way he, the way he lived it and the way he, he, he related to people and even his enemies uh, have made him uh, uh, a figure that is becoming known all over the world, in particular, uh, 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 Pakistan, Karelia, in India, uh, Algeria, of course, France, and but mainly we've been focusing on the U.S. to use his story as a as a counter to all of the negatives that we read about uh, when we read the newspapers and pick up anything these days. Uh, and right now, it, we are very much focused on. Uh, bringing Abdul Qadar's life story to uh, schools, and in particular to public schools in Iowa. Uh, so, uh, just for you to to to, to see uh, to see what our larger framework is, and how, for me, uh, given my own particular background, I came at this uh, at this topic. Of, from a sort of national security standpoint, because I sort of feel that the more you start beating up on, on Muslims in this country, the more that simply validates the message of the Islamists, which is the West hates us and they're out to destroy our culture. Uh, so uh, this is, as I say, just a, 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 a way of, of displaying how our network, which is growing, uh, connects to these different fields of uh, battle, if you will. Um, I also would like to mention uh, three books that uh, I would urge you to look at by, uh, one of which is the book written by Charles Henry Churchill, a cousin of Winston, or distant cousin, but one of the hundreds of Churchill cousins. But this particular cousin was a British military attache in, um, in Lebanon in uh, 1860. And he, for many uh, years, had been tracking the Emir because he was a great admirer of them and, and he wanted to write, his, write a book about him. So he finally tracked him down in, uh, in, in, in Damascus and, and negotiated a deal, which was uh, to uh, write a story and, uh, and that if he would uh, give him uh, uh, one hour a day, uh, which he did for six months and uh, produced a, a book that uh, is called The Life of Abdul, Abdul Qadar, Ex-Sultan of the Arabs of Algeria, written from his own dictation. Uh, 
And uh, this is uh, this book, uh, which uh, is produced by the University of California, uh, had this to say about uh, about this 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 piece of work, which was, this work has been selected by scholars as being culturally important and is part of the knowledge base of civilization as we know it. Um, also, there are two, uh, two books that horse lovers might want to uh, know about, written by uh, the Emir in, in, in collaboration with uh, a French general. Uh, Horses of the Sahara by Eugene Delmas and Horses of the Sahara written by uh, a woman equestrian and is considered uh, no longer with us, I don't believe, but she uh, was one of, is one of the great experts in the world of, uh, on Arab horses and uh, anybody who's interested in horses, particularly Arabs, uh, Arab horses would uh, deeply appreciate either of these two books. And that's, I think, is, is it. Uh, I do want to uh, also say that the next speaker is somebody who uh, has been a huge uh, asset to uh, what Kathy and I have uh, been slowly maybe even timidly developing over the last uh, 10 years, a, uh, uh, a 20 year, uh, a, a, a major in the Marine Corps served for 20 years and he will tell you more about that experience, but he brings a, a discipline focus and a sort of real, real time uh, appreciation of uh, why knowledge and differentiation matters in uh, serving in these complex cultural environments in which we enter as ignorant, ignorant folks and the cost of that ignorance. So Matt, turn it over to you. Hi, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Want to thank what appears to be uh, nearly a hundred participants. Uh, it's very impressive. As a as a uh, Iowa boy myself, I'm not at all surprised to see the the interest in education, especially our history. Uh, and before I begin, I want to say because it would be uh, unforgivable if I didn't how grateful I am to ICSS um, for allowing us to to have this opportunity to present uh, about the Emir, about Al Qaeda, Iowa and about the Abdelkader Education Project. Um, it's a privilege to collaborate with ICSS to, to help in their mission to improve social studies education, truly. Um, as John mentioned, uh, Devro, if I can begin with the slides, or are they on now? Oh. Well, I, I don't need them if it's not, if it's, uh, not ready. Um, as John mentioned, I was in the military for over 20 years, a uh, little over 21 years, in fact. Thank you, Deverell. Uh, I was in the Marine Corps specifically and in the infantry. And in that capacity, I deployed seven times in the course of those 21 years um, to various places that were very focused on the Middle East and North Africa and the Horn of Africa and Central Asia and South Asia. And like everybody in the military then and, and now, um, my focus was on a commitment to milita military power as a means of resolving conflicts abroad. Uh, and that makes sense. That's intuitive that someone in the military would rely on that. But as I would learn, there are a lot more instruments of influence than just military power. And what helped me realize that was while I was in Afghanistan. We were in a very contested area called Sangin, which is a city in the Helmand province and uh, our battalion took a lot of casualties. And for as tough as we were, for as much technology as we had, for um, as brave as the Marines were, um, we were losing. We were losing because, not because we were losing the fights to, to a very capable enemy, the, the Taliban were good fighters, but we were beating them militarily, but we were losing anyway, not because of the military uh, defeats, but because we were not able to gain influence with the population. 
And in that kind of a fight, gaining influence with a gaining legitimacy and influence with the population is critical. If you can't do that, then you can't win. The Taliban understood that. We did not. And it wasn't until I was holding a meeting with people uh, in, in the local area. They, they're called shuras over there. You and I would know them, uh, be familiar with them as town hall meetings. Um, that I was just kind of rolling out these same talking points about helping the Americans and we're here to help and you should be fighting against the Taliban um, through the assistance of my translator who, who became not just an advisor, but also a close friend. Uh, he helped me understand the culture, the people there. He explained to me that these were people who had a proud history of independence and freedom that they understood. They had a, um, a generational, generational lineage with the Afghans who fought the British and who fought the Russians and who were now fighting the Americans. And they were very proud of their ability to overcome the influence of these foreign superpowers. And that's what we were up against. And moreover, they were, they were farmers and they were husbands and they were fathers and they were men who believed in God. And as he explained this to me, it started to dawn on me that he wasn't just describing the Afghans, he was describing Americans. Uh, specifically, he was describing me, and uh, as a as a guy from Iowa who's got a long, proud history of military service in my family, as well as a long, proud history of uh, agricultural service. My family has uh, been farmers in in southwestern Iowa since 1862. Um, as I'm a father, uh, I believe in God. I am a husband. Uh, and it, and I realized that the things that I had in common with these people, were was much longer than the list of things that were different. And when I started to approach the problem like that, I began to develop humility and empathy and subtlety and patience and education as instrument of achieving instruments of achieving our objectives in addition to uh, the military power. And what I found is if I could employ those those elements of what some people have called soft power, then the the military, the fighting, became irrelevant because I could influence them through ways of, of mutual respect rather than coercion. Um, and as I mentioned, one of my closest advisors and later close friend to this day, close friend was a translator who I'm proud to say is an American citizen. But what I'm, what I'm not proud of is that when he got here, he was not treated very well. Uh, and I was very, of course, very committed to him coming to the United States and I helped him to get here very interested and invested, um, fascinated, frankly, by his experience when he got here, because here was a guy who was born and raised in Afghanistan, who was suddenly experiencing this country he had only read about, that he had only dreamed of. And as an Afghan citizen, and now an immigrant, he had done more for the United States, frankly, than most Americans. He had done more for, for the United States, a country that wasn't even his own, than most Americans had done for it in the context of military service. And for, for over five years, he served as an advisor to various American and British military units uh, at significant risk to his own life and his family's life. And he did that because he believed in what America advertised itself to be. He believed that America was a land of opportunity for him. And so he, he literally fought to get here. And then when he got here, he wasn't treated very well. And when, I, when he explained to me some of the experiences he had, he wasn't complaining because certainly being treated not very well was nothing that he couldn't deal with after living in Afghanistan for so many years. But it really bothered me because I understood what that was, was racism and prejudice that was based not on anything real because they don't know him. It was based on cultural ignorance. And so I wrote an article about it. And John Kaiser, whom you just uh, met, read that article uh, it was about the, the need for cultural education as, a, as an instrument of um, resolving conflicts abroad. He read that article and he contacted me and told me about the Abdelkader Education Project. And that's what I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, within the context of my own personal experience, but also how my personal experience is really just a microcosm of what we're trying to achieve uh, in general through Abdelkader Education Project. Slide please, Deborah. So that was a little bit about who I am my personal experience that led me to this understanding of the Amir and who he is. Um, the Abdelkader Education Project is an organization that works to overcome future hate by planting different seeds. We, we believe that hate today 
is the ugly fruit of seeds that were planted many years ago. Uh, those seeds were, were cultivated and nurtured and they blossomed into uh, cultural bias. They blossomed into hatred. They blossomed into racism because that's, what this, that's the seed that was planted. Um, we believe that hate is a, is a learned characteristic. And we work to overcome that, as I said, by, by planting different seeds. And we think the best way to do that is through education. Um, so we provide resources uh, that we'll talk, talk about here shortly that, um, that teaches people that, as I learned in Afghanistan, the differences aside, what we have in common with the world uh, is, is a lot longer of a list than the things that we don't have in common, than our differences. As, as Maya Angelou, the poet said, uh, we are more alike than we are unalike. Um, our work is not confrontational. We don't teach that one culture is, is inherently superior to another. Uh, and again, we believe the and people in the world are, are more alike than they are different. Slide, please. So why, why is what we do something that matters? Now, this is a, and, and the answer, the short answer is, is because it disrupts a damaging and ultimately threatening cycle. And when I say threatening, I don't mean just to us as individuals, but threatening in a national security context. And that cycle basically works like this. Non-Muslims develop negative views of Muslims based on a perception that they're violent extremists. And some of that is earned because there are violent extremists that call themselves Muslims. Anyone who was alive on September 11th, 2001, or who has been alive since then, recognizes this phenomenon where 18 men who, who characterize themselves, although falsely, characterize themselves as Muslims, attack the United States and kill over 3,000 Americans. That action by extremists within the so-called Muslims within that group created negative views among non-Muslims of the, the Islamic civilization writ large. Now, it's, what's, what's so dangerous about that is that these are 18 people who falsely represent a religion, and the West, and specifically the United States, is able to use that, th those extremist actions to develop a negative stereotype of over 1.5 billion other Muslims. So it's a wildly disproportional representation, but that's what happens. So extremists with, with when one group take an action, people within that are outside that group use those extremist actions to judge that group. And then that leads to negative views of Muslims uh, and negative treatment of them. And then the negative treatment of Muslims then provides fuel to the extremists for recruitment so that they can point to that and say, see, they do hate us. They, you see how they're treating us? Uh, it's because they want to eliminate us. You need to join us. And so it creates this cycle that starts with hate, that, that is, uh, develops momentum based on hate, and is constantly fueled by hate. And so what we try to do, what, what AEP is committed to doing, is to create educational resources as I mentioned earlier, to plant a different seed so that people can have a realization of our, our cultural commonalities and, and with respect to the differences that we have, that they're not necessarily something we have to fight over, that they can have those realizations much earlier in their lives than, than I did when I was in the middle of a war zone, um, shrouded in body armor and, and, and carrying weapons. Uh, and so that's our goal and that's why it matters. And I think I can really summarize that with a quote from, from a fellow Marine, um, Deverell, slide please, uh, that you can read there. I'll, I'll read it here as well, um, because it really embodies not just his personal experience, but mine as well, and, and the experience that we are hoping to um, provoke uh, among everyone who, who is able to consume our, our curriculum. Uh, as a young Marine officer, my first significant exposure to Islam came from a two-year tour in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Abdel Qadr embodied what I experienced firsthand from the vast majority of Muslims. I lived and worked with, and what I believe we all ultimately want, compassion from our fellow man and for our fellow man, a chance to live in peace and prosperity, and to be treated as an equal regardless of our race, our religion, our ethnicity, our gender, or our culture. These are things that everyone in the world wants. They're things that I think um, I know I want. And there are things that the Abdukader Education Project is working to achieve beginning in Iowa. And as an Iowan, I'm so proud to be a part of this. What a great opportunity for Iowa to once again set an example, not just for the rest of the country, but for the rest of the world. Um, and with that, I want to say thank you again to ICSS. And uh, I'm now happy to take uh, any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kathy, John, and Matt. 
Uh, we have a few minutes to answer some questions at this time. However, before I pose the first question, I want to remind our participants that you can still submit your questions to the Q&A feature here on Zoom. Now, we are on a schedule, so please note we may not be able to get to all the questions before the end of the webinar. But here's the first question, and it's for Kathy. So Kathy, how is El Cater's background and local history recognized in schools or in the community? Well, it's pretty exciting because people do embrace Emir Abdelkader as a hero, as a role model for Muslims and non-Muslims, but they have to hear about us in order to in invite us in. We do have curricula that we are developing that can um, that is accessible on our website. Perfect, and I will include that information in our email that goes up tomorrow with the recording of this. Uh, our next question is for Matt. Um, please talk about the success of getting the AEP into schools and the outcomes you're seeing from it. Thank you. Uh, our, our success, I'm, I'm so proud and humbled to say, is, is ongoing. Um, we started with just an idea that is now materialized into outreach and curriculums that can be accessed on our website and want to thank you for sending that information out. Um, we are teaching in middle schools and high schools. Um, when I left the Marine Corps, I did a couple of things, but I'm now currently uh, a teacher myself. I teach AP World History in Texas, and I have shared uh, the curriculum of Amir al Cotter there as part of that curriculum. And um, we're continuing to expand that and are in conversation now with the Iowa Teacher of the Year, with the Iowa Department of Education and the Iowa City Public Schools to look for opportunities to introduce our ready-made curriculum into curriculums that and into schools that, that want to discuss not just the history of the emir from a historical standpoint, but also the history of his example through a uh, standpoint of diversity and inclusion. All right, that's great. Uh, our next question is for John. So John, how did you do your research for the commander of the faithful? Uh, I read lots of books and uh, mostly uh, in French, uh, talked to people and uh, spent some time in Algeria, but uh, uh, basically it was uh, reading, reading uh, as a substantial literature uh, and uh, most of it is, is, is biased in the eyes of, of, uh, of Algerians because uh, <clears throat> the people who wrote the most about it were the French. Uh, uh, so to have, have uh, somebody write about their hero uh, in a way that was considered to be um, honest and uh, not there's a sort of a sneering there's a sneering uh, kind of flavor uh, if sneering can be a flavor but uh, uh, that that uh, the, the French authors would often talk about them as you know as, as fanatics because they happen to believe in their religion and be motivated by their religion. Uh, so religion makes you a fanatic, but if you're a patriot, then you're okay. Uh, but uh, there were just lots of nuances, I think, and I also combined combined. Uh, a religious perspective with a sort of secular political perspective uh, that, that, that I, I wrote in full recognition of the religious nature of this person. I mean, he, he was all about his faith and he, what, sets, what set him apart was the, 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 the seriousness with which he lived his faith. Thank you, John. Our next question is for Kathy. Uh, will there be any Algerian representation or special exhibits for Al Qaeda Days this June? Yes, I'm excited about that. The Abdelkader Education Project is reaching out and we have thought about some things that we will be doing. Um, I know that John will be with us and Matt will be with us and I am depending on how COVID is in June that will be one of the limiting factors. But um, yes, yes, we will be talking about that. That's fantastic. Uh, and this is uh, the last question we have for today is for Matt. Uh, and where can we learn more about your organization and how do people get involved? 
What an excellent question and very excited to answer by just a reference to our website, which is www.abdelkaderproject.org. Uh, that's a little bit of a mouthful. So I'm thankful again to you for sending out that link. Uh, once you get there, you can navigate. If you're an educator and you want to see how you can incorporate some of this, if you're just someone who believes in, in what we're doing and you want to contribute through an investment, um, there's a link for you there that you can follow and help us out there. We would certainly appreciate that. This is entirely nonprofit, uh, which means I, as the executive director, I have to be shameless in my constant appeal for funds from people who believe in our cause. Uh, so um, I will shamelessly solicit that here and, and thank you for the opportunity to do so. But our website's the best place to go. Again, www.abdelkaderproject.org. Perfect. And with that answer, this is all the time we have for today's webinar. And I think we can all agree this has been a very informative lunch. Um, also, thank you to everyone joining us today. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History Month webinars on Tuesdays and Thursdays in March. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. Now, for more information and to register for future webinars in the series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And while you're there, you can look into some other uh, fantastic digital programs, such as our Goldies Kids Club activities for young historians, or watch video recordings of the Iowa Stories series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. We look forward to virtually seeing you here again Thursday, March 18th for our sixth Iowa History Month webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.